the diamond I realized that I have to be careful. This is one time I realized The Empathy Museum presents A Mile in My Shoes. Now, the shoes I have here, a pair of women's shoes, they're size six, they're black, they're boots, really, rather than shoes. They're quite lightweight, rubber sole, leather uppers. There's padding around the ankle. They would come up above ankle level. The laces are look absolutely brand new. They look as if they're very comfortable. Probably one could walk quite a long way in them. And they're quite well polished. The leather is slightly mottled, soft, with veining and little ribbings in it. So it's a sort of well-worn leather, but smart and uh, quite elegant, really. These shoes belong to Sarah, and this is her story. I remember those days so clearly. I, I, sometimes I could tell you the minute, because they are so... They're branded on my brain, they're branded on my soul and my heart because they are moments of disbelief. My name is Sarah. I live in Hackney and I was born in Mauritius. I am told at the age of one and a half years old. My aunt visited and she realized when they were trying to walk me that one on my leg, it flops and I couldn't, I was falling all the time. So I had high fever, I was so unwell. It transpired I had polio and I was then taken, whisked away and my parents were not allowed to see me. I was quarantined for six months. When I eventually I returned home, I didn't recognize my parents. There was no one, so to speak, to kind of rehabilitate me, bring me back to the fold. I was always the pariah. And as an Indian person in conversation at home, it was, what did I do in my previous life that I end up disabled? I must have been a monster. So you grow up listening to that. Mauritius at the time was a colony of UK. They wanted nurses. So my brother went. He went to Scotland and he went to a Scottish lady and he married and he didn't tell us. And he only told us when there was a baby. And of course he said, now you know why I can't send any money for your medical bills. So what did my parents do? It's time for you to go. Irrespective of my disability, I have to be a nurse because my mom and dad said so. I don't know much about the outside world because we weren't allowed. In a way, I was age 20, but I was functioning at age 13 in some ways, and perhaps even less. When I came, I had sandals. I didn't have these orthopedic shoes. I had sandals. The snow. The first time I saw snow was the 9th of November. And the cold in my feet, oh, it was like cold hell. And then on top of that, you get the patients calling you, get your effing hand off me. I don't want you to touch me when you're nursing them. Have you got a tail? Come on, let me see your tail. So they would touch your backside often. You get told all this and you get spat at and you cannot complain because I know I cannot leave. I know I cannot move because my parents rely on me. When I qualified and I got such excellent report that I felt this is one time when I realized how wonderful it feels to be appreciated and to get such wonderful assessment. The public who got to know me, the patient who got to know me, the relative, the carers, fell in love with me. Honestly, I'm saying it humbly if I ever can be saying these words humbly. And these are the times when I was growing and growing. I did very, very well in my result. And this is when I met this doctor from Egypt. And I fell for, not for him as in love, fell for the fact that he didn't have money and he didn't have food. So I felt so sorry. And in 1977, we had a kind of vague romance I was still caring for him from a feeling sorry for him. 
and eventually we got married. But the first day of our marriage, he slapped me. And all this sacrifice, all this caring for this human being, I thought the romance will come. How naive of me. He broke my, my left, a, bone, a big bone in my foot. And this meant I had to be in plaster for six months. And he broke my leg on the other side. He stamped on it. Because he treated me so badly, I wouldn't allow him. I couldn't make myself ready for my husband in an essential way. I couldn't because I was so petrified of him. And he usually forced himself. And I ended up getting pregnant. Then he would fight to say, I don't want a black baby. So what he would do sometimes, you think you're having, oh, one of those rare good moments. You lay in bed, he'll, he'll rub your tummy, he'll take his stethoscope, he'll listen to the baby. And then when you are relaxed with him, guess what? Punch, 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 punch in the tummy. He was not having my baby. The thing is, yes, people will say, why didn't you leave? I've left many, many times. And the longer you leave, the more, the more the abuse, the weaker you get. The more you punish yourself, the more you have no resolve. The only way I could do it is risk it and become, have a little place of my own when I'm not renting from anyone. And I did. I got a dilapidated little bedroom and I bought it. And I got a policeman uh, and wife, they were both policemen, and they helped me. And I remember we ate fish and chips. One sat on this flight of stairs, one sat there, one sat there. We did like a zigzag so that we can see each other eating our fish and chips. That is a good memory. In 98, I got divorced about November, December. I was so ashamed because I never wanted to be divorced. I never wanted to be ever. That word divorce is uh, like taboo, like hatred. I hate that word because I never was brought up that way. And I feel that sense of failure is unbearable. On the surface, people think I'm wonderful. And people think I'm jolly, I'm happy. Deep down, the feeling of loathing and fear and hate. The telephone rings, I'm frightened. The doorbell rings, I'm frightened. Is domination, is aggression, is violence carries on. No, no, it's good to get it out. It's tough. It's been tough, tough, tough. And the thing is, I, my instinct tells me that many, many, many women have suffered. Many women have suffered. I was uh, 58 when I retired. I went to courses, courses after courses, even if they are not significant, even if I could be the teacher. I just went to get out. I needed to help myself. Eventually, I did a call called Personal Best. That is the preparation for the Olympics. And eventually, I end up, the volunteers were invited to become tour guides for the Olympic Park. I, I look on it as with such pride and the fact that I was so disabled and gradually improving. I love, love, love people. I absolutely adore people. I, today, for example, I heard about this person quite distressed. I've been invited to help with a tea dance, three to six today. So I ask if I could bring these people and, and I'm taking them. And that, that matters to me. I almost want people to love me as I love them. And there is so much space for us to love one another. When I was in Scotland, most of the conversation will end, when are you going home? When I came eventually uh, to Hackney, 
and I settled in in my flat and I carried on with my work. I felt invisible. Hackney is my life and joy and and I hope I die in Hackney. I love it. I adore Hackney. Hackney is the bee's knees, the best. I'm not the only one in this world who've suffered. So many people have had dreadful life. No matter what I've said to you, I do believe some people have had it even worse. Although I'm very, very hurt by my husband, but I don't wish him the worst in life because in, do, in saying that, I release myself from the horrible, horrible, horrible wickedness that I've gone through. Uh, it's not easy not to think of him one, every day because he, he appears without permission in your brain. The events appear. But you know, life is good. It will be better still. Sarah's story was produced by Rachel Simpson. Her shoes are part of a growing collection of footwear hosted by the Empathy Museum's A Mile in My Shoes exhibition. The shoes and stories come from all over the world. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram to find out where we're going next.